Welcome everybody to the latest colloquium and today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr Ilsa Cleves who is an assistant professor at the University of Virginia and an adjunct scientist at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Prior to this she was a Hubble Fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and her work confronts the interdisciplinary challenge of combining theoretical dynamical and chemical models of planet formation processes within their natal disk environments whilst constraining these with observational evidence collected from ground and space-based missions. Her contributions in this field have been recognised through various awards, including the Annie Jump Cannon Award and the Cottrell Scholarship. And alongside this, she's a PI on a large ALMA programme, DECO, which is probing disk exoplanet connections. I'm sure we will learn more about these intrinsic connections today as we are asked to imagine other worlds. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ilsa to the stage. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Yes, I'm delighted to be here to share with you some of the ongoing work within my group to try and piece together this, this fascinating puzzle of where do the exciting diversity of exoplanet compositions, orbital architectures and so forth, where do they come from? How do they originate? And so I'll tell you more about this early environment, uh, this protoplanetary disk stage today. I'm happy to take questions during, I, you know, whatever best works for this audience, feel free to interrupt and I'm happy to answer. Um, but I'll otherwise give you sort of a tour of what we're doing. There we go. All right. So this is a really exciting time to be thinking about these kinds of questions. Where do we come from? Where do we fit into the bigger picture of uh, the, the exoplanetary worlds that are being discovered? We're going from this awesome era of discovering new systems to now more of an era of doing statistics, population type studies, figuring out if there are patterns in the data. Are there patterns in the occurrence rate with different types of host stars or um, um, companionship? And now we're in a new era where we're doing more detailed characterization, probing down deep on individual planets and asking what are they made of. And it's clear, even if not much is clear yet, <laughs> it's clear that the solar system was not a guaranteed outcome in the process of star and planet formation. So while all of those questions and, and goals are, are important uh, and, and challenging work in themselves, I'll argue that the next set of questions, the next few decades are perhaps even tougher or some of the toughest questions we'll have to tackle. Specifically, what is the most out common outcome of planet formation? What is the most typical planetary system? How do we fill in the gaps, the planetary system, the planets that we can't see within the planetary systems we observe? What orbital architectures are possible? Is it common or not to have gas giants, including those on wide orbits? How do they evolve in time? Where do they end up? And on the compositional front, what is the most common chemical outcome? What is the most common composition for a planet to have? What does it depend on? Does it matter whether there's a neighboring gas giant and what it's made of? How does that affect the smaller rocky planets? And what the, the bigger question here is, is it common for a planetary system, I should say, a planetary uh, system, not planet there, uh, to possess potentially habitable worlds? And so on that final point, it's really challenging. At least to date, most of our information about what planets are actually made of come from some rather extreme systems. They come from planets whizzing around the surfaces of their host stars such that light can filter through their upper atmosphere, imprinting the signatures of what that planet is made of in our data. Or they come from systems where we have a chance of blocking out the light from the star or mitigating the light from the star such that we can directly pick up the light from these planets, often typically younger planets that are still self-luminous. Within our solar system, the area of excitement and action is in between. Uh, our rocky, our, our habitable zone, our rocky planets, our Earth, and the giant planets, the Jupiters, the Saturns, all in this sort of intermediate zone. If you go to the smaller planets, maybe you have a chance. There's some overlap in this habitable zone, radial region with that transiting zone. But there's a lot of questions as to whether these planets are all that favorable or not? I'm not going to answer that question today. 
This problem isn't also gonna be solved anytime soon. This is a plot I took from one of the Astro Decadal uh, White papers. In this case, I think this was one was for the Louvoir mission concept at the time, trying to plan out the future. What are the next generation flagship missions and what do we need to get? What, what kind of quality of mission do we need to find compositional signatures of something that might be lifelike or potentially habitable on a small rocky world? And so depending on your level of optimism, you get very different numbers. In this particular graph, if you assume 10% of all your rocky planets have the right stuff, have water, maybe some uh, geological activity, et cetera, you would need to then observe 28 rocky planets very, with a very deep integrations to pick up the biosignature type gases, something in this case methane and uh, O2, to find just one to statistically find just one. To actually be able to do this, to observe all of these planets and get a whole lot of non-detections takes a lot of time. It'll take years, years and years, even with sort of dream pie in the sky type missions like Louvoir, it'll take years of just the integration time, not even the overheads, right? So this is, gonna, this is a big commitment from the community. I think that this is an important commitment, but we can, in the meantime, do some work. We can do some, some planning to figure out where we should point. Maybe not having to rely entirely on large numbers. And can we say something about what are the most likely environments where habitable planets could form? So while these you know, important efforts to create this next generation of facilities uh, are being carried out, while new discovery methods or techniques to pull out weak signals in exoplanet atmospheres are being honed, we can take a parallel track and we can ask the question, are we, or change the question, are we alone, to are we unlikely to be alone? <laughs> Disks are one of our best opportunities to seeing what goes into planets before they become planets. This over here is an actual scattered light observation of a young uh, uh, solar mass star encircled by an extended disk. This one's called Ion Loop. This is the uppermost layer sort of pointing towards us up here. That's the back edge where you're just seeing the light scattering off the, the back surface. And this dark lane is where all the action happens, where the planet forming zone is. And so we can study systems like I am Loop, like many, many more that we're finding every day to answer questions like, are prebiotic ingredients like organic molecules, water, potentially ice available commonly available to planet forming disks and around which types of systems, which types of stars, which types of cluster environments. What kinds of planets are possible? Is there enough mass in a given disk to even form one Jupiter, more than one Jupiter, and so forth? And how important were the various sort of points along the way for our solar systems uh, original formation and evolution. How important were they in setting up what became now a habitable uh, planetary system? How important were they in setting, this, uh, setting up this environment? Was it important that we were within a massive cluster, but not too close to the center nor too far out, for example? So just like I said, it's an awesome time to be thinking about exoplanets. It's also an awesome time to be thinking about disks because we have so many different windows into what they are made of. With facilities like the Atacama Large Millimeter Ray or ALMA, we can map the composition of planet forming materials with distance from the star. This is all the same disk. This is all the TW Hydra disk. And so here you're seeing just wedges of different molecules, different lines lighting up. For example, there you see carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, which lights up even in low density gas, tracing out to the outer extent. Meanwhile, uh, CS, a denser, more heavy molecule, uh, tends to t trace, pick up the denser gas. So you can even see the density gradient there and, and somewhat of a chemical gradient as well. In addition to seeing what the gas is made of, we can also look at what the solids are made of. And so here you have two contrasting perspectives or two contrasting pictures where at the top, this is ALMA thermal continuum emission from TW Hydra. This is tracing the millimeter sized pebbles um, up to centimeter sized pebbles that we can see. And down here you see the small micron or submicron sized 
dust grains through, via scattered light observations. And so you can see just from this image here, it's not a sensitivity limit. The pebbles are concentrated, while the dust grains, the small, tiny dust grains, are still lofted alongside the gas. And that's just part of the picture. That's just mostly the, the radio infrared picture. We're able to study these systems with, with facilities across the spectrum. Over here, we're probing more of what the dust is doing, where the dust is located, more of the chemistry in the submillimeter and far uh, to near infrared. And then, of course, we need to know what's going on with the star. The exoplanet community always says, like, know they star, know they planet. It's the same as true for disks. You have to know what's going on with the star because that's fundamentally shaping the chemistry of the disk. So ultraviolet, X-ray light are fundamentally reshaping what happens and what planets can in, uh, inherit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And just as a, a picture of what this kind of looks like, here's a very nice cube we're stepping through of carbon monoxide in this one particular disk system. This is ALMA data, where you're being walked through the orbit of gas as it um, encircles the star. And you can even see in this, here I'll play it one more time, you can even see the near side versus the far side, the bright side versus the darker side. And in between it is where CO is starting to freeze out or become too cold to be excited significantly compared to the warm surface? Yeah, that's a great question. So the beam size, I'm sorry, there actually is no scale bar here. Um, the typical beam size in this is about 10 AU, so those noise blobs should give you a size of scale about 10 AU. It's hundreds of AU. Yes, the first disk I showed you earlier, the one that was the red hamburger, that one was 600 AU in size, and it's a solar mass star. It's very strange. All of this data isn't just for fun. We're not just data, data stamp collecting here. We need it because the models of planet formation are getting increasingly complex. And in this case, I'm just showing you the models that go into the chemistry of planet formation, not even the dynamics. You have to know a whole lot about your source, your star, your disk. You need to know a lot about your radiation fields it's experiencing. Then you have to know a lot about the spectroscopic parameters to be able to actually accurately compare your data to your models to make re realistic predictions for the distribution of carbon monoxide, CS, or whatever your favorite molecule is. So you, need a, you do need a lot of this data. So as a brief primer, just to walk it back a little bit from that giant flow chart there, prescription. So the, at, the, at the heart of it, the most, one of the most important features that sets up the chemistry of the disk that gets incorporated into planets is largely the temperature structure. So if you take you know, your star in the center, here's a cutaway of our disk, you have strong temperature gradients both in the radial direction and the vertical direction. We often, you, we talk about in our intro classes like snow lines and how important they were for setting up the giant planet forming region versus the rocky region. So that's sort of under the hood here. Alongside with the temperature gradients are strong density gradients. The innermost disk is something like 10 to the 12 parts per centimeter cubed, maybe higher, outer disk gets to 10 to the eight. So this can be 10 to the 8, 10 to the 5 or lower. So you get really strong density gradients across the disk too. And that's important because it means the chemistry in the innermost regions, the terrestrial planet forming regions, changes really, really fast to local conditions. Reactions happen faster in the denser gas, in the warmer gas. But we can't ignore this vertical dimension. The reason for that is with these telescopes I was showing you, how you know we were tracing that surface, that mid-plane, and the lower the back half, a lot of the observations we have trace these upper layers. They're not directly tracing the midplane, and so we have to really get a good handle of what's happening in the vertical direction. And so here's a brief primer on how this works. So the uppermost layers here are being directly irradiated by ultraviolet photons. Ultraviolet's great, a powerful force at both dissorbing ice, destroying ice, breaking bonds, dissociating molecules, or ionizing atoms and molecules as well. As we go further in, these young stars are fortunately quite X-ray bright. This is because they're so young, they have strong, powerful dynamos, they have strong magnetic fields uh, that are able to trap very, very hot gas, X-ray emitting gas, that they're bathed in bright X-rays, sort of 10 to the 30, 10 to the 31 ergs per second for those X-ray aficionados. So they're really bright X-ray sources. And those x-rays get further than ultraviolet. And they cook 
this molecular gas deeper in, the cooler gas that's shielded. And so this is a lot of what we're seeing with ALMA, is this X-ray dominated gas. The area of excitement, at least in terms of planets, is this midplane, the zone of the ice. Here you have reactions on the surfaces of dust grains. You can have some degree of processing, but it requires some of these X-rays to get in, or external radiation, both from a cluster environment or from distant cosmic rays. You have to have radicals for chemistry to occur, so if the, none of that energy makes it into the heart of the disk, this zone looks essentially just like the interstellar medium. We can even see, if you plot, the abundances, for example, in the famous comet 67P that the Rosetta, ESA Rosetta mission traveled to, it looks almost identical to having been plucked out of an interstellar molecular cloud. It's kind of wild. Meanwhile, other parts of our solar system, highly processed, highly processed. And I should add, just before moving on, that how this is coupled to the other zones depends on the mixing between the vertical regions, which itself, in some cases, is strong, but in many cases we're seeing now with ALMA, there's very little vertical transport. So you have to think about these things a lot. So for those of you that are, are more familiar maybe with like photon-dominated regions and interstellar uh, gas, disks are, have many parallels, but they have a lot of distinct features too. The strong X-ray radiation fields, the higher densities, meaning everything just happens a lot faster. All the chemical reactions happen a lot faster. And then the other very unique piece of, of disk chemistry is that we also have evolving, strongly, quickly evolving dust particles. They're like little volatile spaceships that have, are coated with ice, uh, and they tend to grow, they tend to settle, and then they tend to drift. And so they take those icy volatile coatings with them and can redistribute things like water into the inner, solar, into the inner planetary system. This has a back reaction as, as well as those grains are growing and settling that lets more light from the star uh, reach the inner disk or reach the outer disk, just reach deeper in, and so that can change the chemistry too. So these are really dynamic systems. We need to look at them in, in many different ways using many different uh, tracers. So the ALMA observations I showed you earlier, those beautiful like butterfly rotational diagrams, they're probing the surface layer in this outermost region, the molecule dominated zone up here. The results from JWST, these very nice spectra, I'll show you examples later, uh, are coming from the inner couple of AU. Scattered light, the surface up here. The thermal continuum, mostly coming there from the midplane. Far infrared, more up here war towards the warmer surface. You might notice that there's a big missing chunk, the zone of either ice freezing out or poor excitation. So it's really hard for us to get down to the midplane. You have to choose carefully what molecules you observe or choose lines that are excited specifically or preferentially at these low temperatures. Yeah. Is there any density coordinates? It's unfortunately entirely uh, non-equilibrium. We have to do time evolving chemical calculations and they typically get stuck in parameter, in parts of parameter space that are very much non-equilibrium. So yeah, so maybe, maybe in the innermost zones of the disk where the densities are high enough, but out here we're pretty much out of that zone. Yeah, thank you. So we're in this area here where we don't have a great probe and we have to rely on models, essentially, predicting what's going on in the surface and figuring out what's going on in the midplane. Sometimes, and I'll talk about actually a little bit at lunch, how we can potentially get at the icy zones with, with a very specifically chance aligned systems, but this is in itself its own, um, own bear. <laughs> now, what I'll show you is not the work of just me. Um, we have a wonderful group uh, that works on the chemistry of planet formation at UVA. We have a, a combination of observers, theorists, uh, data, data scientists, we have, we have a collaboration ongoing with the Astrochemistry Lab now at, at UVA where my graduate student and former postdoc here have been working on building up an ice chamber. A lot of fun stuff going on at UVA. I won't be able to share all of their work, but if you want to chat about any of these sort of related topics, my other loves that I won't talk about so much are chemistry in irradiated environments, time domain chemistry created by bursts of X-ray flares and how you actually light up ice in the midplane, both from models, observations, and now lab work.
But today I'm going to focus in on this new effort, the ALMA DECO survey, the Disk Exoplanet Connection Survey that Callum had earlier had mentioned. So essentially, what is the diversity of chemical compositions that are present in disks? And can we relate this to the diversity of compositions now being seen in planets? We'll also look at how much different is the inner disk, the terrestrial planet forming zone, and how does it compare to the, the larger radii we see with ALMA? And if I have time, we'll talk a little bit about how do we figure out how much mass is there available? What is the mass budget for planet formation? And what are some new initiatives there? The dream, of course, in this field would be to have a complete end-to-end -end model of like, I have a disk here and I can tell you exactly what planets you'll get out. If we can model all the detailed disk, uh, chemi disk chemistry and predict with a realistic model of planet formation and then the full evolutionary history of planets, that would be amazing. But right now, we're sort of in this comparison stage. We look at our disk chemistry, we compare to what folks in the exoplanet community are reporting, and vice versa. Folks in the exoplanet community are measuring different planetary compositions and saying, did this come from here, or did it come from you know, somewhere else, i.e. trying to predict things like migration. An exciting avenue that's been opening up in the last now you know, 15 or so, or tw almost 20 years, is this idea that the carbon to oxygen ratio in the atmospheres of exoplanets is a useful probe of the gas out of which this planet formed can tell us about something about where it came from. This original idea came back from uh, Karin Oberg's work in 2011, where if you look at the different locations of snow lines, you can say, all right, they should jump in this predictable way. We should be able to figure out where they, from whence, from whence they came. A few years later, uh, we discovered that a similar exercise could be done for disks. We could rough, we could pretty, uh, uh, we could use hydrocarbon emission in disks to back out the carbon to oxygen ratio pretty accurately. It's incredibly powerfully sensitive, the carbon to oxygen ratio in the gas, the hydrocarbon emission. Over here are real observations, this is again TW Hydra, of this particular molecule, C2H. There is noise in this data, but it's really hard to see because it was so shockingly bright. It was a really, really deep observation because no one expected it to be so bright. Oh, yeah. C, C, H. It's linear. It is, yes. Yeah, so the vast majority of interstellar molecules are these weird, like, unsaturated, strange molecules. We don't, you know, things like methane have been hard to find. You know, typical molecules, the hydrocarbons we find are C3H2. Uh, so C3HH. Drawing diagrams with my hands is, is fun. Um, yeah, they're really weird molecules. From, uh, with our models, you know, small changes, we can show small changes in the carbon to oxygen ratio. So here going from 0.5 to like three result in over a hundred times different column densities in the hydrocarbon column density. Uh, sorry, uh, the C2H column density. And so from this, we can very sensitively back out the carbon to oxygen ratio in the gas. And the chemistry behind it is fortunately in this one case, really, really simple. This is the only slide I'll have with chemical reactions. I think, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> um, the formation, uh, there are a few channels here, but the main takeaway from the, the left-hand side is that all paths from carbon, either neutral or C plus, lead to C2H very efficiently. And the simple back reaction is throw in some oxygen, it all goes to CO. It's a very robust uh, path. You didn't think I would say astrochemistry is easy today, I'm sure. <laughs> but in this case it is, in this case it is. Four, four or fewer atoms, and it's usually okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so as you said, the carbon is not saturated, but there's plenty of hydrogen there. And maybe, maybe it's obvious that they share those, those reactions, but why, why doesn't um, methane just, just uh, form in, in your dome? So the dominant form of the hydrogen is not atomic. It's mostly molecular. It's not a very good fuel for like creating new, new molecules. Yeah, so you have to actually introduce things like your X-rays or your cosmic rays, ionize your hydrogen first, create actually an even weirder molecule, hydronium H3+, <laughs> and then that finds another H2 and then starts to spit out hydrogens. Yeah, great question. Okay, so what, how do they stack up? How do the planets compare to the disks? So we, what do we have so far? 
Okay, so there was a beautiful paper late last year by Keelan Hawk. I think I've been advertising this paper very aggressively over the last few months, and I've never met Keelan Hawk. If any of you know, you can let them know that like I'm, I love this paper. Uh, they, they collected the all these C to O measurements in a way that disk people can understand. <laughs> and split it up with stellar mass or stellar mass, planetary mass, and, and many different parameters. Uh, so here I'm showing you the planets that have been measured via direct imaging. Big caveat: like many of these come from the single system HR8799, but they are the direct imaging planets. They're, they're, these are the locations of these planets. Here they're typically pretty young. They're all down here near close 2.5. The disks are way up here. Some overlap down here. I am Loop, AB, Auriga, both very young, but a lot of them are way up here. So we're in a nice era. Stats are beginning to build, but there's a tension. <laughs> like these are all sitting mostly up here, and the overlap is not as good as we would like. So are these the same coming from the same gas? That's a great question. So uh, you could say there's some caveats. These bars are roughly like the spatial resolution of some of these data sets. Uh, and some of the modelers did not try to do a radially resolved carbon to oxygen profile on the disks. So hence bars here, rough estimates, but you get the idea. Generally quite high, a lot of hydrocarbons, very high C2O. The planets don't look the same. Okay, so what do other populations of planets show? What do transiting planets show? All right, so if I plot now the, the sort of hot Jupiters over here, Okay, maybe there's some overlap. I did not try to spread these out in any reasonable way here. This is just less than 0.1 AU. Uh, but you get a spread, and it maybe is a little bit closer to the outer disk. So maybe some migration is at play. Maybe they all did just form out here in this kind of disk and move inward. But we still do have some tension. These are still pretty low down here, and these direct imaging planets are all pretty low. So maybe these planets formed from disks that didn't look like these. Maybe they formed at an earlier time. Or maybe they formed around smaller disks, disks that are not maybe represented on this graph where I can literally write names of disks. Some of the most brightest bias 600, 300 AU size disks. Maybe we're not looking at the right ones. So this motivated us to go ask for a lot of all the time to try and measure the carbon to oxygen ratio towards not 10 disks, but now 80 disks, targeting stars that are a little bit more representative of the exoplanet host stars, both the M dwarfs and the, the, the solar type stars. Our beam is not as beautiful as that image I showed earlier, the 10 AU beam, that's really hard to do, that's really expensive. But instead we have more of an 80 AU resolution element. And we're uh, trying to target, yeah, like I said, stars that are more representative with disk masses that are spanning more than just the top of this diagram, the bright commonly observed disks that are circled in, in red up there. Okay, so how do we actually go about using this? So we're using different rate line ratios here, the hydrocarbons, which trace our carbon to oxygen ratio. We're also using different other tracers here, the CO to N2H plus ratio to trace uh, the gas metallicity, for example. Happy to go into those details for those that are interested after. We should be able to back out from this product, the gas mass as well. We tried to make this a, a representative sample. A less biased sample than the ones that have been previously observed. We go down to disk masses that are disks that don't have enough gas, as far as we can tell, to even form a Neptune. So sub-Jupiter disk masses. We had to split them over different regions, so they're across. If you're you know, well versed in all the star forming regions nearby, we cover Lupus, Taurus, Ophiuchus, and Chameleon 1. And to get the lines we really wanted, it required three spectral settings. So there's a lot of all the time. But with all that giant bandwidth coverage, we'll do fun things, like we'll do deuterium to hydrogen surveys of HCN, maybe even of the hydrocarbons, which will be fascinating if we find them. We'll localize uh, the positions of small organics. We have a host of lines, so we'll get excitation. We're gonna do sulfur work. Uh, recently in this field, sulfur has become this awesome tracer of na nascently forming planets deeply embedded in disks. Total surprise, it's a shock tracer in the ISM. Seems like young planets might be exciting shocks. So we'll be able to look at this in depth. There's also a lot of fun physics. We'll get more accurate stellar masses from kinematics. Uh, that's being led by Shi Wei Yin. Well, because we have 80 disks, we can actually look at how they're spatially separated in the sky and see if there are pockets that are chemically similar or different. And so a, whole, and a, a lot more. So we have over 150 hours of, of time here. Of course, there's a lot of data. Classically, a person will get a data set and spend like three years on it for like one disk. <laughs> 
Uh, can't do that here. Obviously, that would take way too long. And so we have to come up with a pipeline. And so we've been benefiting a lot from uh, developments within Alma to create an automated self-calibration pipeline. Uh, we're doing things like co-calibration, where if there's a bright source observed at the same time, we can apply solutions. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And we're trying to automate our data inspection by knowing that this gas is in Keplerian orbits. So we're able to use what's called match filtering, the signal processing technique to find weak lines. So what is match filtering? So in this case, in this particular use case, you have your data set, your noisy data set over here. You have some kernel. In this case, our kernel is gonna be uh, basically the, how a Keplerian disk would appear to Alma in the Fourier plane. <laughs> so that's you know, Kepler, a simplified Keplerian disk to Alma. This is what it would look like to us. You, slide your kernel through and you do a cross correlation and you look for your impulse response and you can find lines in your data without ever making an image. It takes minutes, not hours. So this is where, what we're excited to be doing. And with DECA, we're able to actually feed back in the orbital motions of the gas, the masses we're deriving to get more accurate kernels. We can even improve our kernels. We can do this in an iterative way. This is, these are 66 of our AD sources. They don't look, if you're familiar with like the D-sharp survey, beautiful rings and gaps everywhere, right? They don't look like those because they're normal. They're like 20 AU disks. They are not D-sharp, they're not humongous disks. So they're pretty, pretty boring. We do have some transition disks that snuck in there. A couple of sneaky binaries, we were trying to avoid those, but binaries, can't get rid of them. And this is just 66 because the other ones didn't fit on this slide. Now, this also requires a massive modeling effort. Uh, Dr. Dana Anderson, my former postdoc, now faculty member at Naval Academy, uh, is leading our modeling team, where she's bringing together, uh, I think at this point we're now at, at least seven, yes, yeah, seven different, different modeling teams from across the world, Japan, Europe, Chile, and the US, doing a massive cross comparison of everyone's chemical models in the field and seeing where the uncertainty is. How accurately can we take hydrocarbon column densities and get C2O out? with all the model uncertainties folded in. So it's a heroic effort over the last year and a half at this point to wrangle seven different modeling teams. But with the, I can't show you the results yet. I'm not allowed to show you the results, but they agree surprisingly well. I don't know if any of you know, there was an exercise like this a few, now almost 20 years ago where the PDR community got together to compare codes and it was a disaster. Everybody was completely off. But because I think because of that hard, one battle to bring people together. The codes now are pretty good agreement. To actually go about applying uh, these results to our 80 disks, we can't model all 80. So my graduate student, Amina uh, Diop, now recent NASA finest awardee, hooray to do this work, uh, will be applying uh, machine learning methods, surrogate modeling and other techniques to attempt to actually effectively model the carbon oxygen ratio in each of our disks without having to do a custom built model for every one of our 80 systems. And she's testing how it changes with MDORF versus solar type, et cetera. And we're gonna make all of these results uh, uh, public to the community, so uh, stay tuned for this. It's a large team of people. This is out of date already. Um, and so here are my, my wonderful co-PIs at the top. More graphically put, we span a lot of time zones. It makes scheduling telecoms a nightmare. Uh, we are 58 collaborators, 45% early career uh, folks. I got them all together to come to Charlottesville, many of which had never been to NRAO before. It's pretty awesome. The next step, while we're working on all this ALMA data, we're also, we have a, a program with a J, JWST that I'll talk about a little bit next. So everything I've been showing you, we're talking about tens of AU scales, 100 AU scales, like way in the outer disk. Bulk gas, but it's still pretty distant. How does it compare to what's happening where the action is within a few AU? We don't think it's entirely decoupled from the outer disk. Theory suggests that this process I talked about, those uh, volatile ice-coated spaceships or dust grains are transporting various icy uh, materials like water, CO2, methane, ammonia, whatever it is, inward into the innermost disk as these grains are growing and decoupling dynamically from the gas. But we, this has never been tested. This is just sort of an idea out there. Um, while Dana was at UVA, she had done this theory, theoretical pre-JWST study to show if you can measure a series of commonly observed lines 
you can actually extract out the carbon oxygen ratio pretty accurately, uh, regardless of what you put into your model. Turns out that the inner disk is so extreme, the temperatures are so high, the ultraviolet photons are so uh, strong that effectively the chemistry goes to sort of a relatively similar uh, carbon to oxygen ratio, regardless of whether you start with carbon grains, methanol, whatever you want, whatever mixture you want. So she was disappointed because she wanted to see the evidence of carbon grains getting enriched into the inner disk. That was her, her PhD thesis. But I was excited because it meant we could actually measure carbon to oxygen ratios in the inner disk gas pretty accurately with JWST. There are a bunch of theories still out there uh, for different scenarios. You could have gas and ice just evolving in place, and you can get sort of different carbon to oxygen versus distance profiles, the Oberg models in the back in the dash line. So this is just chemical evolution on top. Icy pebble drift brings in a bunch of oxygen, drops the carbon to oxygen ratio. If you have dust traps, blocking water ice from going into the inner disk. You can drain some of the water from the inner disk and raise the carbon oxygen ratio substantially. These are all different scenarios from various papers by um, Richard Booth and collaborators. And so we uh, went with this idea, asked last cycle, JWC for time, to complement 18 archival observations with MIRI, asked for 22 more MIRI spectra, a lot of data. <laughs> 40 JWST spectra in total to try and get at this question. Does the outer disk look anything like the inner disk and how does it vary? We also uh, jokingly called this one iDeco, inner disk deco. No Apple copyright, I hope. Don't come after me. Uh, <laughs> this is an example of one of the spectra that um, from one of our disks. This one was published uh, as part of a different team. Sierra Grant led this beautiful paper. Here you see this, you might say, oh, it's all noise, but then when you plot the decomposition of it, and you see it's all like a bunch of lines of CO2, water, uh, acetylene, HCN, yeah, over there, it's really stunning. So over there, yeah, not noise, it's real, it's data. It was so deep, they found the isotope of CO2, so 13 CO2. All right, so what do we see? This is preliminary. Um, on, uh, I, I'm presently thinking about writing a JWC proposal. They are due in a week, for those that know. <laughs> Uh, based on this plot I made on the train over. Uh, maybe it'll show up. Okay, so where do our disks lie? So using the models of Dana and our, rate, our line ratios we have already, all of our inner disk points are in this zone. And there are some, there are three, or there's two upper limits, and there are about six or seven lower limits. It doesn't overlap. They're pretty low compared to the exo, even the transiting exoplanets. So you can almost imagine it's like a little bit flipped. <laughs> so the outer disk is too high compared to direct imaging. The inner disk planets are too high compared to the disks. Is everything just switched? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, we still have to work out the details, so don't take this away at face value. We do see that they're, they typically are, the disks are pretty low on the whole. Um, but there's another piece to this puzzle, coming back to the Keel and Hawk paper. So Keelan did this really nice work here, splitting up the populations of, of planets, uh, carbon to oxygen ratio versus now uh, the planet's mass, companion's mass. And there's two populations. They found the split between them is about there and conducted various statistical tests and found they come from different underlying populations. It cannot come from the same underlying population. So it was a very humble paper, but as the, this, I think the disk community is gonna be very excited or is very excited about it. Um, because this would suggest maybe these planets did fundamentally form in a different way. Over here, these are massive planets. Gravitational instability, basically top-down collapse of dust and gas, scrambles any variation in the gas versus the core composition. It's a really energetic process forming something by GI. This would very, be much more consistent with having a carbon to oxygen ratio that looks basically stellar at that 0.5 value. Over here, these low mass planets, more likely to form by core accretion, so you get more variation. Yes? So these are all, yeah, down here, giants, yeah, yeah. If you, if you had to put the Earth in the plot, the Earth has, is so carbon poor, we also have so little oxygen, a lot of which is locked up in the silicates, that I don't even know, yeah, how it, it, would, it would be, yeah, they're both poor, they're both volatile poor. So I would guess lower, but 
again, so carbon uh, in the earth, in the precursors of the earth, like intocyte chondrites, and even the carbonaceous chondrites, all very carbon poor. There's a really nice graph that shows like the different parent bodies. And yeah, it's, it's, they're carbon poor, but likely due to geological processes rather than formation processes. While this is more of an imprint of formation. All right. All right, so how am I, I have like five minutes maybe? Okay, okay. All right, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit. I can, I'm happy to take more questions on this particular topic, but I'm gonna pivot to the case of disk mass for a second. Okay, here, I get to see all my animations again. Boop, boop. So uh, at least I'll, I'll summarize, in terms of deco, it's gonna be challenging to necessarily exactly reproduce the C to O ratio. Because, in some sense, a lot of these likely did migrate. And we don't know where they necessarily migrated from. We could, do a, we could run lots and lots of models to figure out what parts of the disk they sample. But at this point, the aim of DECO is not going to be to necessarily reproduce any specific planet with any specific disk, but we're going to try and get that broad statistical sort of representation. Can we reproduce the distribution of planets or not? Or do we have to invoke a different formation environment? Like maybe planets formed not out of these disks, but rather much earlier, perhaps when the star was still forming. This touches on, um, that point touches on um, a related point. Specifically, these planets out here, these very massive planets at these very large radii are not anything like anything in our solar system. So if you plot like all the giant planets of our solar system, they're like in this band here. These things are 10, some five to 10 Jupiter masses. So they're not really representative. Why do we see actually so many wide orbit 10 Jupiter mass planets? This is not a natural outcome of the planet formation model. To actually go about answering this, we need a robust way of actually measuring disk masses. So given a total amount of gas, H2, or solids, what we wanna know at the end of the day, what is the average yield of planets? If we add up the amount of planetary mass per star versus disk mass per star, is it 1%, is it 10%? What is that number? We don't know. We also wanna know that number as a function of time. How long do planets have to form? Do they have to all form very early or is there a long tail? Is it getting replenished at a later stage? It's really hard to answer because H2 does not have a permanent dipole and at 10 Kelvin, we're not seeing much of it. But fortunately, there is an alternative. And back in the era of Herschel, now 14, 15 years ago, we were able to detect hydrogen deuteride. Now an asymmetric molecule has a great dipole and we could detect its emission towards disks and measure disk masses. The HD molecule doesn't freeze. It has a very well-constrained abundance within the local bubble. So it's a really great mass tracer. The downside is we didn't figure this out till later into Herschel's mission, and we only got a few detections. But I'm excited that, to report that in the, the coming month, uh, we had recently accepted a program to now survey 30 more disks in hydrogen deuteride. We'll also get observations of cold water vapor and ice features with the planet, I have to always remember what POEM stands for now, <laughs> Planetary Origins and Evolution Multispectral Monochromator. It's technically not a monochromator, but it is using a new technology called VIPAS, so it can directly zoom in on individual lines at high resolution with high sensitivity, but it's not giving bandwidth. It's not like ALMA in that sense. We're excited about POEM because it has this velocity resolution, it has a sensitivity, and I get to work with this wonderful team, so it's PI is Gordon Stacy out of Cornell, and I'm working with Gary Melnick as well. So we'll do a lot of other science too. We'll do disk dispersal with O1 uh, and more. So we're expecting launch in uh, 2029. So stay tuned there. Yes, ah, uh, yeah, yeah, apologies, yes. So this is a stratospheric balloon-based mission. So we're planning Antarctic flight. Should about have about two week, uh, we hope, uh, two week uh, campaign. But if we get lucky, there've been recent campaigns that have beat that by many, many weeks like Gusto. And so, yes, yeah, sorry, I, yes. Balloon-based mission. Well, hope that would be the dream, right? That'd be the dream. But also in that era, uh, we have, even if we can't recover it, we should be able to downlink all the data. Since basically the balloon mission, or the, the balloon program is moving towards more of a model of using things like Starlink, which have a high data rate. So we should be able to pull down all the data, 
regardless of the outcome of the, pro of the program. But in an ideal world, you recover and you do it again. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Doing too many things, clearly. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so basically to summarize here, uh, it's clear planet formation is an incredibly complex process, both physically and chemically speaking. It involves many fields uh, and, and many different, uh, uh, dif different environmental, system-wide, planet-wide uh, processes. But we're in a really nice era where both data in exoplanets and disks is rapidly improving, which has allowed development of models, improved models to better understand what's going on under the hood. Better models of things like ice transport, for example. This, uh, this has been a great, um, this has been greatly supported by having all these in-depth sort of source specific studies that have really allowed us to hone these models in depth. But these statistics have shown us that there is a really broad diversity within the chemical environments that disks uh, hold. This will be very critical for trying to do things like planet population synthesis. This is not a new idea. Folks have tried to take a, our best idea of what a disk would look like, a planet forming disk would look like. Uh, and then would uh, try to predict how planets form out of that disk given this sort of mass distribution and abundance distribution. We can now do this a lot better. And this will allow us to inform the statistics of what we're seeing with these observational campaigns on the atmospheric compositions of exoplanets, but also the large fraction of planets that we can't see or may never see. And in the future, these direct imaging efforts to go find, you know, Earth 2.0 or whatever it is, our, bi our favorite biosignatures, biosignatures, whatever they are in the year 2040, 2050, are expensive. It's an expensive endeavor. Do we spend all our time on the endorphs? Do we go after the solar type stars? We need to have better information motivated by uh, the physical and chemical environments that these disks harbor. What do we actually expect? So we're hoping to address these questions with programs like DECO. All right, so with there, uh, I wanna thank my group, our funding agencies, and also you all for your attention, and you know, also advertise, we have a number of postdoc opportunities uh, that will be advertised or already advertised on the job register. So please reach out if you're interested in working on this, these big questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joseph, for a fantastic talk. We have got good time for questions to finish up. So I saw Chris go first. Um, I think you touched on this a little bit, but you mentioned at the start that ALMA shows very little vertical transport, am I right? Yes. yes. In those observations and whether they have any understanding of them theoretically. Yeah, that's so it was a bit of a surprise. So essentially what those groups were working on, they were effectively trying to take, you know, all the motions that we could observe they would try to use a Keplerian, basically Keplerian velocity profile and a thermal, like additionally adding thermal motions. And they would see if there's any room for anything else. And the answer was no. So there was some work on the disk that I showed with the butterfly pattern, HD162296. You know, it's a very, very massive disk that has a lot of rings and gaps. There were beautiful work, a uh, beautiful paper by Richard Teague that saw that there was some velocity motions into the gap maybe, but it's really challenging to, to pick that out because you're talking about meters per second on top of data with a native resolution of tens of meters per second. So it's really challenging. You need really, really uh, bright disks to do that with really massive disks. And so then you wonder like, is that a bias in itself? Are these massive? And then thus you have more of these vertical transport motions. But for the rest of the disks that have been studied for dynamical like motions, it's pretty low turbulence at this point. Um, another way to construct this or another way to look at the same problem is people are looking at all of those fine ringed structures in disks with uh, the D sharp uh, survey. And if you measure the width of the ring as a function of azimuth around the disk, the width doesn't change. There's no evidence of thickening or height. It's effectively like one AU high at a hundred AU. They're really dynamically cool if you wanna think of it that way. Okay, then you asked about theory, which I can't answer on this particular case, but it seems that these disks are extremely sort of quiescent, which is confusing. You can look at our solar system and you can see evidence of processed heated minerals in the comet forming zone. It's a question. It's something we're still on to figure out, yeah. Maybe it's shocks of infalling streamers later, who knows? Lots, Lots of ideas, ideas, but not answers yet. Yeah. 
So you mentioned from the carbon to oxygen balance ratio that the outer disk is more prone to gravitational instabilities and the inner disk is more prone to core accretion processes. That why does the gravitational instability not happen in the inner disk as well? I think so. That's what the data. So so I I didn't want to you to necessarily take that away from that plot. So we just primarily see it's it's an observational bias that we primarily see those massive disks at those large radii because they are well they're massive and they're very hot. They've still retained 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 a lot of heat information. And so they have been just some of the easiest direct imaging candidates. It would be nice if we could push down to lower mass uh, planets for direct imaging at those wide orbits, but it's just sort of at below the level of possibility, at least from what I know. Maybe somebody in here is writing a JWST proposal to find the small ones. I hope. So you said that there's a big model comparison effort underway. Yes. Could you tell us what just give us an idea of what the error bars from systematics will end up being because you didn't show any error bars on yeah. on those c to o but maybe you could just you know indicate that on on one of your plots so for okay so for the the alma case versus the inner disk case it's a very different error bar let me go back here okay so for the outer disk case for a given model you know the given that strong um factor of three change in carbon to oxygen ratio, changing you know, column density by a factor of 100. Within a given model, the error is small. But then the model to model, the systematic error, is what we're trying to get at for the first time, the one you're bringing up. At this point, it looks like we're in within a factor of 50%, which is really, really good. To me, is shockingly good. Maybe to others or people who work on <laughs> closer objects, seems high. But for the outer case, 50%. We have not yet characterized the inner disk error. The inner disk has the same uh, benefit where like tiny changes in carbon to oxygen result in really huge changes in column density and flux in these lines. And so I wanted to put error bars on that plot and they were smaller than the data points in this case, which is not real. I don't believe that. Um, that's just within the model, the carbon oxygen ratio changes, makes uh, uh, really big changes in the flux that are detectable. And in fact, the reason it's appearing like a band there is because I didn't try to get below, like into the noise yet. And so this is the limit of where we stop detecting one of our mo key molecules, acetylene, and the top is like where we stop detecting CO2. So it's not a real band, you know. It is definitely low, but the exact limits don't take anything away necessarily from the exact band. But we're working on the systematics for the inner disk. They'll be smaller than the outer disk just because the temperatures and our densities are so much higher. The chemistry is a lot simpler. It's a lot faster. And so it kind of converges more quickly than the outer disk, which depends a lot more on the details. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm to you later, too. They're massive grids. <laughs> and you had one? These disks uh, often have winds. And um, are we going to learn something from absorption line studies? So GAVMC. Some of these winds, parts of the wave seem to come from inside and they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the, so from? Uh, branch on systems where we can see you know, through the upper surface of the disk or the lower part of the wind to the photosphere of the star. So we're the, we've tried a couple of times to go after like C1 and like look for like deviations from Keplerian, but because like at the disk surface, the wind kind of couples into the Keplerian motion and it gets really hard to tease the two things out in that narrow layer. Um, but we are, I'll, okay, what I'll say is with the JWST data, we're not just seeing, you know, this. These are, Miri is actually makes images. It is like an IFU. And so, there are lines of H, we go from five micron to like 25-ish, 23 really, because um, it gets to be pretty noisy. But there's lines of molecular hydrogen and they are giant. Yeah, it's all emission. Oh, it's all in emission. Yeah, so we're just seeing the H2 in emission, but we're seeing huge winds and the winds are not correlating with the system accretion rate. So I don't know, like the outflow rate is not matching the uh, accretion rate onto the star. Weird puzzles. <laughs> Question there. So when you go from HD mass to the total mass, 
Yes. The, it, does, does the conversion depend on the age of the system? Or, I mean, what are the biggest uh, uncertainties? These, so it doesn't depend on the age of the system because the HD module is so robust. So we're not at temperatures where there's like no deuterium fusion occurring because the disk is so cool, you know, hundreds of Kelvin at most. Mostly the gas is coming from 40 Kelvin. So the deuterium is robust. Some deuterium molecules are forming, but it's affecting HD, the main reservoir of deuterium, at the like sub 10th of the percent level. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's not time evolving. The biggest caveat is it's because it's a July molecule, the uh, J equals one oxidative energy is like 100 Kelvin. So you need gas at least 20 Kelvin uh, in temperature to excite it. And so that is the like, the, you have to know the temperature of your system really well to turn that HD into a gas mass to get the you know, excitation effect, effect corrected for. Yeah. Um, one last question. Yeah. <clears throat> so for the zero ratio and the radius that plot, if you consider to put Owen Orion kind of disks, um, do you actually see the difference between your sample and, for instance, a harder disk? So Orion disks are harder because of external for evaporation. They are heated up and they're harder, and the CO, as far as I remember, the CO mass is higher too there. They are higher, but what we've discovered is that the fact that these environments are so warm, you have all this external heating effect, is that, so I would love a hydrocarbon survey of Orion, which hasn't happened yet, but that would be amazing. But at least from what we're seeing from like the CO, from the HDN, the HDO plus, like other molecules that have been observed, they have chemistry much more consistent with lower numbers. So this, these high values, at least as, you know, my, my current working theory, we need models to back it up, but it's really essentially the oxygen being removed in the formation of these icy pebbles that go into like comet, cometesimal like body, whatever we want, planetesimal bodies, whatever you want to call them, and getting locked up in the midplane and then not being able to be stirred up ever again. So locking up oxygen. But we don't, we have, there's some models like by Sebastian Kreit, but they don't have a lot of chemistry in them yet. But that's sort of what's happening. That seems to be shut down in Orion and clusters like Orion. Excellent. So a thorough cross-examination there to finish up. Um, <laughs> but uh, as per normal, we'll now proceed to the Dilworth room for McCall lunch. But before doing that, let's thank Elsa once again.